Hello everyone, uh, this is Juan Freire and in this talk I will briefly overview the topic of direct to satellite Internet of Things and this talk is on the frame of the space networking lectures uh, uh, part of the blog course uh, I, I'm giving at the Politecnico di Torino in Italy So uh, I want to start by showing where does direct to satellite IoT networks stand respect to other type of networks uh, in, in the field? So in this chart we see on the on, on the x-axis we see the range on the distance where the communications or the nodes are typically placed respect each other or respect a ground station or, or a gateway and on the y-axis we have the bandwidth or the data rate to be more, more precise. Um, so we see that on, on, on the shorter range side uh, we typically have cellular networks where somehow current Wi-Fi H802.11x is sitting um, as, well as, as, we, and as well as cellular networks such as UMTS or LTE, 3G, 4G and so on basically sits there as well uh, on, a, on a little bit on an extended range at least in comparison with, with, with Wi-Fi so and then in uh, let me add the pointer laser here so I can actually show here. So and then personal networks here in this context is also uh, on the same range uh, than, than let's say shorter range cellular networks, but with slightly and less bandwidth or less data rate than, than the others. So uh, in this in this in this area, basically we have uh, wireless personal area networks, wireless sensor networks, machine to machine networks, and mobile area networks, and vehicle networks, and so on, with different protocols sitting there. And then we have uh, like a third interesting area, which are low power wide area networks. Uh, these are LPWA networks, and these networks try to extend the range. Uh, while keeping uh, quite a good efficiency in terms of power, uh, this is this is kind of an axis emerging from the IoT uh, domain, where we have to have like power efficient nodes, small nodes uh, with very low bandwidth typically. So we are paying with bandwidth the fact that these are very low power networks uh, because we want simpler devices, we want cheap devices, um, and therefore we get we typically see bandwidth in the order of bits per second if not uh, and payloads of packets of in the order of a few bytes and this has a, a, a recent a recent protocol set that that are flying around and we go over a little bit here like LoRa, Sigfox and, and, and NBIoT as well um, and LoRa and, and this type of LPWA protocols are, are having quite a popularity nowadays uh, as they have some some real market uh, uh, opportunities here and the fact is, as, I, as we show here, is that this, this wide area uh, coverage uh, and low power devices basically do this at the expense of data rates and, and some delay tolerance as well. This, this low power in these devices is achieved by, let's say, uh, relaxed duty cycles where you don't have immediate access to channels. Uh, and this basically derives in, in battery saving properties of devices where they spend some time uh, without transmitting or even without listening. So, uh, and this comes at the, at the expense of some delays and some higher latencies uh, on the data, which uh, it's, it's, it's good enough in, for the market and for the application that these type of networks are, are thought for, where uh, we're talking about industrial IoT or, or some, some type of measuring devices and, and which report some type of metrics that can be later, later processed and so on. So, um, this, this is this is this is uh, low power wide area networks, and and we want to talk about uh, how are we moving to the satellite domain from here. So naturally, we take a look at the current standards or, or of LPWA. We're talking about uh, up to tens of kilometers, typically, uh, depending on, on the protocol, depending on the configuration, and so on. And um, when we want to think about where do we need to go if we want to go to satellite and, and say. Well, actually, our gateway is not going to be, let's say, tens of kilometers away from our nodes, but it's going to be likely on more than 500 kilometers in case of a low orbit satellite. Then uh, we're basically moving in this direction, uh, in this to, to direct to satellite IoT networks. So another an another interesting thing to see is that, we're, so another way of arriving to direct to satellite network is say, well, there are some higher bandwidth services nowadays present from satellite networks and 
we're talking about Iridium, Orbcom, Global Star, Inmarsat, and we have so, so many examples of this that these are services which are already existed. Uh, most of them are basically evolutions from what were uh, voice services. Um, and now they provide data services, namely uh, internet services. And here we're talking about, uh, uh, most, in most cases, these are proprietary protocols. So these are not open protocols. And these are, um, this is, can be a little bit of, of, uh, of counterproductive for, for us that we're trying to understand what, what's the protocol property that we're looking for. Um, but still, it's another way of getting to direct or satellite IoT networks. And, and this is basically, we do care about both, like satellite networks and LPWA networks, which both are like, uh, a, a, the intersection of both will be taking us to this, how do we have IoT from uh, direct to a satellite, basically, what a gateway is flying in orbit and we have only our devices here on ground. And, and this is somehow illustrated in the figure below where direct to satellite IoT implies a direct connection between the devices on ground, namely low power devices, namely IoT devices, namely cheap devices as well, connecting to a LEO satellite in this case. We're talking about LEO because uh, uh, this is already acquired the constraint link and the device is already quite constrained. So uh, we are not talking about geo satellites in this case. Uh, so the hypothesis it is direct, that direct satellite IoT are typically are, are typically going to be sitting on, on a LEO satellite and not on a geo satellite because of the difference in, in, in distance, right? So um, again, a LEO satellite can be sitting in, in the order of a few hundred kilometers away, uh, likely higher than 350, but likely not more than 600 kilometers height. Um, and this is the link that we have with direct to satellite IoT. And this, this should be contrasted uh, against what's indirect to satellite IoT, which is interestingly what where the re most of the research is, is, is currently sitting on. So if, 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 we, if we basically search for, for what's, what's the community is currently investigating, uh, this is the typical approach because it's safer, with, where you have basically uh, a single gateway that is in communication with a satellite, with a passing by satellite, and that gateway in turn communicates with independent IoT devices. So you can imagine that, uh, that in this case, um, the distance between the gateway and the device is actually not, uh, is the same that the one that we're using a traditional LPWA protocol. So what's happening in this indirect to satellite IoT case, what we're having is traditional satellite protocols from the gateway to the satellite and from the satellite to the gateway, so, sorry, it's from, from the gateway to, to internet, namely, and to the gateway to the IoT thing. So we have traditional satellite protocols, which are satellites networks protocols, which are sitting right here. So this is done, doesn't change. And from the gateway on ground to the IoT devices, we are using traditional uh, wide area low power networks. So actually, in this case, although there, are, there is room from research and, and room from, to understand how to, uh, let's say, uh, communicate the, these two these two domains of protocols, then direct to satellite IoT, which is the one sitting here, actually requires somehow uh, a mixed protocol that actually takes properties from satellite networks and also takes properties from low power wide area protocols. So this is the room uh, where we are starting direct to satellite IoT. And direct to satellite IoT actually is, is quite interesting in comparison with uh, indirect satellite IoT. So namely, we don't, re we don't need rapid infrastructure, uh, an infrastructure there. So this is kind of an appealing thing, especially for the sister area or where you want some even rapid deployment uh, of, of your devices. So you don't need to have this gateway here in the middle that obviously takes powers and requires some uh, infrastructure to be placed on and so on. So this is, this is convenient from DTS IoT, basically. Um, also, this is also convenient when these devices here are there present for some small period of time, right? So uh, if this device exhibits somehow uh, some kind of a heavy mobility or intense mobility, uh, where basically implies that you will need to move this gateway or you, or you need to hand over to another gateway, then it is quite convenient to think that you get rid of these gateways and, and basically put your gateway in space. So your gateway becomes the LEO satellite and not the gateway um, here on ground as in iron direct to satellite IoT case. So this is the context. This is where DTS IoT is sitting with. And this is uh, well, we are going to discuss in the next slide a little bit. So uh, we are going to overview what, uh, what's about LPWA networks and what can we say about satellite networks uh, on the next two slides. 
and they were going to discuss what are the challenges from integrating these two and moving into uh, this direction here on direct satellite IoT. So in this slide, uh, we, we, we go into a little bit into details on what, what's, what's there for low power wide area networks. Um, there, there are several protocols happening in, in, in this context. Um, likely I'm going to name like the most relevant or the most famous or the most popular one. Um, likely LoRa and LoRa1 here on the first one is quite, is being quite popular nowadays. And LoRa is, 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 a, is a wide area protocol where um, it, it has a proprietary physical layer. So this is the LoRa part. LoRa, LoRa has a proprietary physical layer. Um, I'm just here leaving a reference to one of the uh, papers that actually tries to decode this physical layer and make some, some, some spectrometers analysis on how this physical layer looks like. Um, but still, this is, this is a close proprietary fix you, you need to buy from a chip from, from, from a proprietary manufacturer. And then on top of this physical layer, you have LoRa1, which is basically based on a consortium. Uh, they define all the, all, all the link layers and network layers and upper layers of the systems. LoRa is very popular. And they use on the physical layer, they use some kind of spectrum technologies where uh, the signal power is basically spread it with a chip code over a wider bandwidth. And this basically makes it uh, harder to detect and, and also offer some kind of system gain uh, when talking about multiple access, where we are basically have several devices trying to access uh, a single gateway. And this is achieved by providing uh, an independent orthogonal code to each device in such a way that the spreading factor is orthogonal between all of them. And therefore, uh, the collision is minimized between these devices. And this facilitates uh, medium access control. We somehow have this discussion here. So um, we see that, that Ulora One is a spread, spread spectrum technology, basically that allows you to achieve somehow the long range feature. Um, and this long range feature is, is, is achieved by, by, type, by using this type of, of physical technology, but also by, by using lower frequencies, like sub gigahertz band in this case, where lower frequencies actually enable you uh, higher distance of, of your link and so on. So this is basically achieved by LoRa, a combination of spread spectrum and also sub, -giga, sub gigahertz band. A second technology and second protocol is also very popular is NB IoT, where NB stands for narrow band IoT. And this is actually the narrow band is the, the second type of the, the other type of, of, of energy modulation or that uh, of modulation that allows you to have high energy per bit. So narrow band, uh, let's say feature or approach is like the opposite of spread spectrum. So they basically try to concentrate in a small pieces of bandwidth a lot of power of the signal in such a way that uh, you have like the, the, the overall noise that is affecting your signal is really low. the bandwidth of, of the noise is so small that your signal uh, because the signal to noise ratio becomes quite quite convenient for you to decode so this is another approach uh, a little bit in contrast, uh, contrast with, with spread spectrum so a narrow band uh, uh, is, is basically materialized in, in IoT by NB-IoT. And this is a 3GPP uh, standardized uh, protocol, so, which is interesting. And, and, and 3GPP, naturally, for those that are not familiar with, 3GPP is the, is the consortium or the standardization committee that standardized mobile uh, telephony, cell phone uh, uh, protocols. Namely, we are talking about LTE here. We're talking about UMTS. We're talking about, namely, 3G and 4G and this type of protocol. So naturally, the 3GPP purpose of proposing MBIoT is to also somehow uh, leverage existing cellular uh, infrastructure. So you will see, in comparison with LoRa, is that LoRa is, is kind of an IoT network uh, created from scratch. So, um, so the, 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 the core of the network, not only the access part, but also the core of the network, namely uh, the server and so on, they are notably simpler in comparison with MBIoT, where MBIoT actually leverages existing uh, infrastructure from cellular networks like base station controllers and, and, and other servers present in the core network. This is, this is a distinctive feature for MBIoT. And MBIoT can work on licensed spectrum. And this is another important uh, difference. So what's happened the cellular service provider is that the spectrum is already there for them, right? So if you're a telecom provider uh, in any country, therefore, 
your bandwidth is already with you and MBIoT slightly favors the utilization of licensed spectrum because this is what cellular, uh, let's say, service providers already have. And this is the difference in LoRa, where LoRa actually is, is standardized for um, ISM bands. This is, uh, this is an unlicensed band where everyone can transmit there. And these are bands, uh, for instance, like Wi-Fi bands. This Wi-Fi is, is, is an example case of this unlicensed band. But uh, LoRa is, is uh, operates in a lower, in a sub gigahertz band where um, there is no licensing. And being having no licenses uh, can be uh, has obviously its pro and cons. So basically, if you work on a on a free band, on an unlicensed band, then you don't need to get into bureaucratic uh, issues like for reserving this band for you, and also on economical aspect that. These are typically bands that need to be paid and can be quite expensive. So LoRa, in one aspect, simplifies this. Um, but the issue is that you have no guarantee that uh, there will be any other services working at the same band, and therefore you need to cope with the potential interference that other services might be occurring, might be generating in that band. And this is this is where MBIoT stands based, uh, with some advantage in this context because there is a guarantee that you will have your band for you and you will have not have uh, interference from any other one. Um, so, and then we have a third one, which is Sigfox. So Sigfox, is, uh, I briefly will name Sigfox because it's a proprietary service. Sigfox is, is a closed uh, service that uh, you have a company that basically uh, builds the network for you. And it, it, as far as I understand, it has some flawless uh, performance. It work very well, but this is can be, uh, from an academic point of view, it's, it's not so of, always of little interest because of, of not having access to the details on, on what is the, the specifics of the protocol that, 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 that Sigfox uses. But as Wolf mentioned this, um, and, and, and one of the, the properties of Sigfox that we know is that the physical layer is focused on an ultra narrow band approach. So this is uh, the extreme from narrow band from NDIoT. So we're going from, from, from let's say, from a narrow band to a narrower, narrower one. And in this case, we're talking here from NBIoT talking, uh, uh, working at around 25 kilohertz, and then six Fox bringing a uh, ultra narrow band down to in the order of a few hundred hertz of, of, of bandwidth for signal. So this is the bandwidth is, is largely concentrated in the in, in the case of six Fox. So and then I, I should briefly mention also that um, there is like a, some strong standardization effort, but still there is no not like a let's say a, a hope of convergence in in the short term. So the family of, of of IoT protocols, as you can see already, is quite diverse, and and each of them are having a specific uh, let's say uh, successful deployments. But there is not that they are in the, in the short term horizon like a single technology that will dominate. Um, and this is, this is basically mapped to a standardization efforts. And we see that IEEE is there sitting, uh, trying to adapt their wireless sensor networks protocols and, uh, and Wi-Fi protocols so that they can meet this low power wide area by increasing the cycle and so on. And we see also the European standard, uh, doing the same for, for some proposals on the other side. 3GPP, we already mentioned for MBIoT, but also oh, they also have another specification specific for LTE. And then IATF is also struggling with their IPVC stack, which, by the way, you know, IPVC stack um, can be quite fat or quite, uh, let's say, uh, big for uh, what we're talking about uh, in, in this type of IoT networks, where the payload of a packet can be in the order of a few hand, of a hundred bytes, for instance. And in this context, uh, an IP header can be in the order of 10, 20 bytes, depending. So the overhead is dramatic in this case. And, and IATF is also making their efforts on, on trying to understand how internet protocols, which such as TCP IP and so on, can be adapted or, or let's say filtered or reduced in such a way that can be suitable for this type of, of IoT network. So there is like all this standardization here. Um, and on top of that, we have the consortiums, which are basically, technically they're not standardization committees but per se, but they basically are agreements. There are agreements between manufacturers and service providers in such a way that they coin, use the same technology. And, and we one of the most important likely here is the LoRa Alliance. That is the one that is defining the dollar, LoRa one protocol set. But there are some others like Wakeless Seek and, and Dash 7. Um, so, for instance, Dash 7 is a consortium of, 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 let's say, industries and companies that were working with RFID. So, you can see that what's happening in IoT is basically that 
many people from many different worlds like we're seeing work from internet we're seeing people from work from the cellular telephones we're seeing people from wi-fi and, and data uh, wireless services and so on all all trying to converge to this internet of things which is um, as you might know, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a quite a broad name and quite an abarcative name, and this kind of this is both the let's say like the holy grail of internet seems to be here, but also uh, this diversity makes makes this 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 overall paradigm a bit weak in the sense that uh, so far there is not a clear uh, approach and unique approach to tackle the IoT market so far. So this is. This is where we are standing in the current IoT market, at least here on ground. I just go over this, this slide quite quickly. This is a more detailed comparison of LoRa and MB IoT, which are likely the most popular uh, one here. This is taken from, from a reference here and I'm, I'm leaving you here. Now here you can see the details. We mentioned that LoRa is a license, MB IoT is a licensed one. They have different modulation, different bandwidth. And we are talking about uh, data rates in the order of uh, from bit per second to kilobits per second in both cases. Um, we see uh, there's different, uh, let's say, technical details that I leave you here. I uh, don't want to go into this in details. Um, and this is an example, for instance, of the frequency. This is the if x is the time and y is the frequency. This is the chirp, uh, one of the chirp observations of, of the LoRa physical layer. That was taken in, the, in this in this reference. I leave you here. Reference number one. Just some more information on what what was seen in, in the low power wide area network market. Now let's see what happened when we moved to space. So this is where LP the low 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 power wide area network setting, and then we're talking about this is a messy protocol set, but still considering this, what happened if we start considering making this operating from space? So let's let's move to the space domain. So what's happening in space? So in space, protocol sets are also not so much uh, convergent, to say somehow. So on the one hand, if you take a look at current space missions, uh, namely science missions or NASA missions or ESA missions and so on, what type of protocol they use is, they are typically based on what CCSDS has defined for years already since the early 80s. So CCSDS is, the, is, a, is a standardization data, uh, data committed for space communications where most uh, the biggest space agency in the world actually participates and 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 this has been quite successful for for its purposes and and actually thanks to ccsds like current missions uh, from different space agencies around the world actually uses kind of the same protocols and they have interoperability worldwide so if let's say nasa launches a satellite and they want to downlink their data in a, in a ground station in argentina then there is no so much bigger adaptation that you need to do because it's quite, quite sure that they will use telemetry or telecommand, TMTC, or AOS protocols, such as the one that's being used nowadays, for instance, in the International Space Station to uplink and downlink data. So CCS has been successful in this case, and, but most of TMTC and also AOS are protocols that are thought to be used in a point-to-point -point way. So this is not really, there are not really network protocols per se, but they are point-to-point -point protocols to upload and download data from, from spacecraft, basically. And, uh, and naturally, there are some cases in, in space exploration uh, where you want to have some kind of, of multiple node presence. And, and one of these cases, naturally, what we're showing here on the right, where, uh, for instance, in Mars exploration, where currently there, is sitting two, uh, there are opportunity and curiosity from NASA sitting on the surface, and then we have some several orbiter satellites, namely three from NASA, two from ESA, there is one satellite from the, from, from the Indian Space Agency and so on. And these satellites are somehow collecting data from this rover and, and, and relaying this data back to Earth. And, 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 and there is somehow some principle of multiple node presence there. And, and this, this kind of, of linking where a satellite can communicate with potentially two assets on ground, on the surface, in this case in Mars, then they have been developing some kind of protocol like uh, to, to perform this transfer and this negotiation of who is going to talk with who at any given moment. And this, of course, has been mapped into what's called proximity one protocol in, in, in CCSDS. Um, and, 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 and this proximity one protocol has been somehow migrated later to USLP, which USLP is somehow an attempt of integrating TMTC, AOS, and PROX1 in a single protocol set. So, but 
Um, what we can say from this is that uh, USLP or PROS1 are actually attempts to go to multi-node uh, uh, networking in space, but the design and, 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 and the, the operational ground for, for this protocol are uh, very limited in, in terms of number of, 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 of nodes. So we are talking about a few uh, likely dozens of nodes, let's say, in surface in the, in the, in the, in the mid-term. So you can imagine that they we're far away from having... Uh, let's say, coverage for thousands of nodes in this case. So these are definitely protocols that are a little bit far away of, of what we're trying to do with the rate of satellite IoT. If we observe another services, we see that there are also some geostationary services and LEO services that are actually providing service to what's called VSATs here on ground. And, and, and these are, namely, for instance, one of the, these examples here, uh, is, there is a DVB standard from, from European standard that is used for, let's say, broadcasting some television signals or other type of signals. And then there is like a, like a return channel for, from these services that is a multiple access channel to a geosatellite. Uh, and there is some high kind of aloha and multiple node uh, approach here uh, that might be of interest in, 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 in the, in the direct-to-satellite IoT because it's quite similar to what we're trying to do. However, it's, it's worth mentioning that uh, this type of links from a geosatellite, geosatellite typically uses uh, quite large antennas here on ground. So we are not talking about a small device or an IoT device. So we're talking about maybe a, a large device with a parabolic antenna, similar to those that you see uh, for, let's say, television of a satellite, such as, as, such as DirecTV or these type of services. So um, there is some likely adaptations that need to be done here. And, and, and if we go move away from the standard world, then uh, namely, two examples that we need to mention are Iridium and Inmarsat, one sitting in LEO and another one sitting in Geo Orbit. So, um, Iridium is recently offering uh, their SBD or Short Burst Data Service, where they're trying to get into the IoT market from, say, from space. And, and, and Iridium sitting from LEO, um, I think it has. So, uh, this is more information on, on, on Iridium here. So, uh, Iridium is basically trying to offer their short data burst product um, for, for IoT, or where they use the, the low orbit satellite network for, 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 for getting this, this data uh, on space. But we see already that this is, this is quite a big device, actually. This is not a small one. I mean, we're we talking about a few centimeters, and this is not even so much cheap, uh, not even in terms of the device and also in terms of, of the data that you want to send. So um, this, is the, this is hardly seen as a, let's say, like a massive IoT thing that we see because of the low price. So, and similar things happen with what's called the ISAT Pro service from, from Inmarsat. Inmarsat is on Geo, so this is a little bit even complicated um, in terms of latency and so on, but still possible. And prices are somehow on the same range that we are seeing from Iridium. And also the, the size of the terminal is also on the same, uh, on, on the same range, actually a little bit higher uh, than that. But still, this is something that is happening here. So this is, and actually, the Inmarsat and Iridium sell this as, as, as IoT-ready things. But um, uh, this is far from what the IoT uh, thinking is uh, uh, at this moment, where you're thinking of small and, and very inexpensive devices. So in, in low-power wave area networks, we're talking devices that are, are expected to cost less that, than $5. And here we're talking about devices of uh, several tens of dollars. So we are, we're kind of uh, far away from that. So um, they say we are just not there yet in, for space IoT, and particularly for direct or satellite IoT in this case. Um, so this is, this, is, this is an open research topic. This is an interesting topic, and, and basically it's bringing our attention. And I'm going to overview a little bit of detail. So where, um, where are we standing at this moment? So let me proceed with the presentation. So the first question that arises, is it physically possible to have a small, a very, very small device that can actually have a link with a satellite, uh, with a passing by satellite? And, 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 the, uh, and this is, uh, I have found like a very, very important and recent job uh, work on this context from Airbus and COA Leti in France that actually has some prototype for, for achieving this, which is quite, quite a small chip. That, um, that actually has all the digital and the analog uh, components that you need to do this. Um, these are the kind of the properties that, that this chip is actually exhibiting. So, um, so it's, it's, not a, it's not a bad data rate at all uh, for, for such a small device. 
and and actually the results of this of this work are, are quite promising in in my opinion and actually you use this as a, as, a, as a motivational base to say well i mean if you have the let's say the the, the integrated circuits design f or equipment and so on and you can really pay for this then there is room for for for, for developing these type of devices and, and this actually these same chips actually include the power uh, amplifier and so on and you can see that the, there is a plus 12 dBn of auto power uh, with a very reasonable consumption and and this consumption is somehow here compared with uh, existing uh, devices so you can see that for instance for 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 transmission peak consumption we can see that they're quite close on are pretty much on the same uh, range than current the, the terrestrial IoT devices but this is always uh, this is able to communicate with with low orbit satellites the data rate is naturally quite quite slow compared with with the with the terrestrial analog, but still is like, still is an interesting thing to to observe. Um, this is a chip, for instance, that works on L band, so we're talking about 1.5 gigahertz in this case. It has quite a small payload, so we're talking about 65 bytes on the downlink and 30 bytes on the uplink. Um, and what else? So um, on, basically, this is talking about USB symbols and so on. And this is a narrow band, an ultra narrow band approach. So where uh, the bandwidth of the of the is 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 um, is really low. So this is kind of, of focused on can be what can be like a Sig Fox uh, technology for for IoT from the Rico satellite IoT with using Sig Fox. So I, I leave you with this. This is a very interesting. Uh, research that you can you can observe if you're interested. So considering that um, the physical thing is feasible, then what uh, besides besides obviously improving this physical uh, link budget property? So what are the other challenges? And naturally, this is this is also highlighted in in, in the reference I have just mentioned from Airbus and and and, and Leti. Is that what what happened with the medium access? How can we actually uh, make and survive in a network where we have hundreds of thousands of devices which can reach a given satellite at any given moment? Um, and this is already an issue for the terrestrial IoT, where um, the scalability is already shown to be be somehow limited. So imagine a satellite will have a coverage of several kil hundreds of kilometers, likely on ground. So the number of devices that can be covered by a satellite can even be higher than that, so scalability is definitely an issue, and scalability maps to how do we negotiate and how do we share the medium, the, the access to the medium. So uh, for wireless LAN protocols, coverage sense multiple access with collision avoidance has been the state of the art thing, and this is currently working very well in near in near range uh, communications such as cellular and LTE and even on and even on Wi-Fi and so on. Um, so LTE and, and, and this type of cellular are typically used this for, for negotiation purposes and then the main, the main data uh, transactions happens on a dedicated band, so no collisions there. But anyway, so um, I mean, this works okay for a low number of nodes at close range, as I mentioned, but this does not uh, scale well when we have several nodes and especially when we have space to ground distances. And, and this, this plot that we have here actually shows some very old uh, research that we saw an analysis we have made on what is the overhead for a passing by satellite over a point on ground using uh, this type of coverings as multiple access with and without um, a request to send clear to send uh, feature. So the four way here on the left is a request to send clear to send enable uh, coverings as multiple access. And this is a two way only, namely RTS and CTS are not there present. Um, and what we see here is that um, the the, there is like the average data rate and the average overhead that we have on one and the other is, is significantly high. So we're talking about 75% and 60% when we remove the request to send and CTS. Um, and this is because of the reasons that uh, what is the time to transmit this, this packet and getting the acknowledgement from the other side at a propagation range, which is in the order of hundreds of kilometers, such as the one we have in, in ground to space communications. So. Um, so actually, the, the overhead of, of using current sense multiple access for back and forth communication, such as the one I use on, on Wi-Fi and so on, uh, incurs in severe overhead and basically renders this type of solution uh, not, feasible, not feasible for DTS IoT. So, and, and, and this, this basically drove LoRa 
an MBIOT to go for a different approach. So LoRa, for instance, they, they, they went to Aloha Pro, a very simpler Aloha protocol where basically there is no um, carrier sensing, right? So basically I'm just transmitting on a random uh, approach and with the expectation that my randomness helps me in getting this data to the destination. And MBIOT kind of focus on a different uh, approach where basically uh, MBIOT profits from the fact that you have a base station from a cellular service provider that can actually somehow schedule the access via TDMA. So this is similar than what LTE works or GSM work or what or so on. So there is some kind of scheduling that can be executed here and therefore the transmission of the node is more controlled by, by a centralized entity. However, you can imagine that uh, nodes will need to receive the schedule and comply with it and so on, so you need to be listening now and then. And this typically incurs in a little bit higher uh, energy consumption in, on the MBIOT in respect with LoRa. And this can be seen on the table we have, we have presented in the previous slide as well, where MBIOT is a little bit more demanding in terms of energy. Um, but there are some other, also some other approaches. And, and this is, for instance, uh, one I would like to mention is somehow a derivation of the, of the previous research where this ultra narrow band uh, can be actually used for what's uh, time frequency aloha as well. So it's like an, like, like, I, like an evolution of aloha where you can exploit this very narrow band and this is somehow illustrated in this case. Uh, this narrow band signals can actually be uh, transmitted over different uh, frequencies. And therefore you can somehow have arrive to some type of FDMA approach where um, uh, the, your, your randomness is not only in time but also in frequency and then you might still have some collisions there but you can minimize the collision because you're actually using uh, the frequency um, in, in, this, in, this case, in this case. However, what happens is the, 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 the band of, of the bandwidth of the signal are so, so much uh, small that they become quite compatible with the Doppler effect that we have, especially in, in space, uh, in satellite IoT. So the collisions can actually happen in a very particular way, uh, such as we show in this, uh, this, this, this research actually so shows in this example, instead of having just this type of collision that we have here on the time domain in traditional Aloha approaches. So um, what we can say, however, is that, that both approaches might still be not good enough for massive VTS IoT, right? And because this already be proven that uh, that already these technologies are somehow limited. Uh, for for instance, in the lower one uh, analysis, there is a research there I also leave here in the slide that is limited up to 120 device per almost four four hectares, and and this this means that um, so the, the device density is limited already for a ground station of LoRa here on ground with a coverage in the order of 10 kilometers range. So you can imagine what's happening with a coverage from a satellite where we are likely covering hundreds of thousands of devices. So how are we able to scale in multiple access where, um, where we have a satellite covering so much surface on ground? So uh, this, is, this definitely is a challenge that still needs to be met. Likely a second challenge I would like to highlight today is the architecture. So in what's happened with the, so the medium access control and the physical layer that we have seen is somehow feasible uh, is, it, this is our access part. So this is where the device is accessing the, net, the, the core of the network. But then there is a secondary challenge, which is on the core of the network itself. Um, and, and both MBIOT and LoRa, for instance, they have, um, they have, a, they have a core network that uh, is thought to be working on ground and in, in, in a stable uh, environment. Um, and MBIOT, as we mentioned, is based from, on, from traditional cellular architectures and infrastructure. So this is, this is what we're actually seeing here on the left, where you have the, this e B, you have the, 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 the MME, the SGW, and, and so on, and the different elements that, uh, that are present in a traditional infrastructure, where, yes, yeah, you can see naturally, there is no satellite here in the middle, right? And, and there are some research there with uh, some analysis where where do the satellite sits on in this architecture? Where, uh, which features should be running on the satellite? Which features should be running on ground on the other side? So uh, and naturally, there is not a clear agreement on which is the best way of doing this. And, and, and neither on LoRa. LoRa still, even though LoRa architecture is quite simpler, that there is no clear way or, or discussion on whether 
which of the features that are nowadays sitting on the network server or nowadays sitting on the gateway host uh, and need to be uh, run on the LEO satellite and which ones need to be somehow uh, run on ground. So, um, and, and, and this is also an open, an open topic that requires an in-depth uh, study of what, which are the, the IoT architectures that, that are being proposed and how they can be adapted to have some part of the core network working on space. So this is another challenge that's still there present for, for IoT. For DTS IoT, where basically the satellite acts as a moving gateway. And, and, and there are, naturally there are some other topics. So um, uh, as we mentioned, like lean budget and topology, we saw it's feasible from a lean budget in perspective, uh, but still naturally this is a very first research and there is room for, for more analysis on this regard. Um, and then there's some topological aspect. So this is naturally this also depends on what's the topology, what's the shape that this network is going to have. So, um, so actually designing the constellations, which is the constellation topology that will fit better this, uh, this type of direct or satellite IoT devices, then, uh, then this, this is definitely a research topic and also room from DTN. DTN standing for the late solar networking where satellites, you know, uh, you might not be able to have like a massive satellite constellation for having IoT and therefore uh, you will might likely not have also uh, inter-satellite links or ground station all over the world to deliver this data. So there is room for store carrying and forwarding the data on the satellite and then deliver it, delivering that to ground. So naturally increasing the latency, but also increasing the feasibility of having this network deployed anytime soon. So uh, maybe room for the later on networking in this past tech is definitely a research for, for it's, it's definitely a research topic and, and a very interesting one actually. Um, some other topics actually is localization. So for instance, the IoT offers, MB IoT and also uh, LoRa offers localization services where you can understand where your, your IoT device is sitting at any given moment based on the gateway location. But now that we have a moving gateway, then localization can become quite tricky. And this is also something that, that's worth taking a look and analyzing which up to which standing, at up to which point the DTS uh, system can actually cope with this type of services. Roaming is definitely an issue, uh, not particularly maybe in LoRa, where LoRa is not thought to be used in, a, let's say, with a traditional cellular network, but it is for MBIoT. So MBIoT based on cellular networks, uh, they definitely need to consider roaming because you have a cellular network provider and therefore uh, if you move your devices from one to the other provider, then uh, you will need to have some roaming agreements and so on. And if we think on DTS, IoT in this case, then you have a, basically a global service provider. So how is this actually going to become feasible from a bureaucratic perspective when you have, uh, you might need to, uh, let's say, establish agreements with local cellular service providers and so on, and there will be some roaming issues which are yet not even covered by the standard themselves. So uh, actually how to deal with this type of internationalization uh, is, is, is quite tricky. Um, and so far, most of low power wide area systems have been deployed nationwide only. There is not an international one. So this is internationalization of, of DTS IoT is also a kind of, of, of an interesting topic to be, to be studied in the near future. And naturally, uh, on the higher layer protocols, what happened with the transport protocols? So we mentioned, um, we mentioned uh, 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 IATF trying to adapt TCP IP or IPv6 to be used on this on this context, but then on top of that, what happens with the congestion control and the flow control typically offered by TCP, for instance, how, how is this feature covered by, by, co by current directed DTS IoT protocols? How, will, how will, will they be covered? This is still an open research topic. Um, and this naturally involves end-to-end -end reliability. So are we having end -to -end, are you having hop by hop reliability measurements with uh, DTS IoT? Are we having end-to-end -end one uh, what's happened with security? Are we having some authentication method and it's also uh, has, a, has some uh, leg into the roaming part where uh, are, we, are we authenticating via same devices such as we do with cellular networks? So this is also a, a, a quite an open topic on, on DTS IoT. And also how do we leverage broadcast and anycast, which is like the nature of a satellite communication is to profit from its broadcast and anycast cap capacity. And how do these localized broker uh, anycast, for instance, can 
can work on, on a satellite, uh, DTS IoT, where only one satellite can be covering part of the ground and another sa satellite is covering the other part. And then you need to synchronize this and schedule this broadcast from, from satellites. And how the protocol support this is also a challenge. So these are some, some highlighting topics that that worth mentioning uh, as open and, and open questions in, in directors of the late IoT. And just, there are a few two ESAs, uh, status of work, that actually support uh, these type of challenges. And I'm going to briefly go over this. One of them um, here is, is, is about defining an E-NOT-B structure to be running on, a, on board a satellite. And one of the things that they mention is naturally that uh, there assumes that many NB-IoT protocols layer can be modified to make this work. And this actually somehow backups my, my previous slide where, where I mentioned about the architecture. What sort of the architecture placement is, should be on, on, a, on this type of, 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 of direct satellite IoT. So um, this is one of the uh, statement of work. And the other one has to do with the physical layer. So, and this also, the statement of work actually suggest somehow to modify the DBB standards on the return channel, as I mentioned previously as well, such a way that uh, that we can minimize the power consumption of devices so that we can realize an uplink and a downlink, be an S-band link in this case, um, by using traditional DBB protocol sets, but with a minimal uh, channel and minimal power consumption of devices. This is just another statement of work from ESA that actually somehow backups, uh, what, what's the case. And let me just may briefly mention some experiment we have made on with on the Colson project on this context. So the Colson project was is a project on D3TN, it's a startup company from Dresden in Germany, where we got uh, some funds from ISA, we have a, a approval from ISA from doing this, and, and ISA backup on transmitting data from underwater to satellite networks. And this has some IoT components in the place, and just to briefly overview uh, these experiments. So uh, the Colson projects actually they have um, this uh, have some underwater nodes. I'm going to go briefly over this with acoustic signals that communicates between them and between uh, a buoy that the buoy actually have a, a, an underwater link, a receiver and transmitter, and they also have an antenna to communicate with passing by satellites. So the idea is to use commercial of the shelf components in such a way that all this network infrastructure can be placed. Uh, on a cheap and efficient way, and therefore this can eventually become a service for 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 wine uh, shore parks, for fishing, for uh, mining, and for many other applications that needs to have some uh, measurements of underwater applications as well as some surface application eventually. And we have made an experiment. So and, and this experiment is using what's what state of the art of today of, of what can be somehow of the of satellite IoT. Uh, for this, we have tried some Orcom device that actually uses this I, uh, ISAT Pro um, service I already mentioned on the first slide, which is this device here. You can see the date, the, the power consumption and its characteristics here. So you will see this is definitely far away from a, what, what one would think of an IoT device, uh, but still something that was feasible today. And, and this IMASAT Pro we uses some, um, some geosatellites from IMASAT for doing this. And then we have developed some of the underwater nodes with very low power uh, and quite efficient uh, uh, devices, uh, and then with a very low data rate still. But this was basically a proof of concept of what would take to have this uh, direct satellite IoT working here from, from underwater networks to a buoy and from the buoy uh, to the geosatellite in this case. And the way of integrating this on an upper layer uh, protocol perspective, and this is somehow also backed up by, uh, by one of the challenges I mentioned, which is how do we deal with the upper layer protocols that needs to travel end to end from the device under the water, in this case, to the buoy, from the buoy to the satellite, from the satellite to the gateway on ground, from the gateway on ground to my server on internet. And one of the, of the, of the research that we are doing in this context is also using the lighter, the lighter networking solutions for this. And, and, and this. and this is a proof of concept that this can actually be achieved. We have successfully tested MicroPCN, which is one of the dilent toler networking protocol stack implementation, which is open source and, and freely available. Um, so, and, and this actually proved 
that we were able to measure things under the water, transmitted through the Y to the passing by satellite, which in this case is not a passing by, it's a geo satellite, and get this data on Grafana in our servers here on ground. So this is a little bit the architecture of what the data flow that was following in this case from, from this, let's say it can be named like a first experiment of direct to satellite IoT involving also underwater links in this case for, um, for measuring underwater properties. So this was all. So uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed the talk and find some motivating examples and motivating open research topic for direct to satellite IoT. Um, we believe this is an interesting topic. We believe there is room for doing research and for enhancing uh, current IoT domain from space. And we'll leave you my, my contact here. So if you wish to contact me or reach me, my name is Juan Freire and this was developed as part of my research state of, uh, in the Politecnico de Torino in Italy. Thank you very much.